So I have an older brother and his name is Matt. And Matt and I are only 16 months apart. So we're really close in age. And I remember as I was growing up, my mom had said, I love that you guys are so close in age because you'll grow up and be best friends and, and all that kind of stuff. The reality was because we were so close in age, we actually became almost like enemies. It's almost like whatever he wanted to do, I want to do the opposite. And if I want to do this, he wanted to do the other thing. If I wanted to go left, he wanted to go right. If I liked a certain team, he liked a different team. And we were constantly like in this competition back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I remember when I was like nine or 10 or 11, somewhere in that age, that uh, we both enjoyed basketball and we would lower it down the rim and we would dunk on it and it was just a lot of fun. Well, by dunking on it, we bent the rim quite often. And so my brother decided he wanted to fix it. And so for whatever reason, instead of lowering the hoop, he was 10 feet in the air working on this basketball hoop with a wrench in his hand and, and just kind of working away at it. Well, I'm the younger brother and I did what younger brothers do. I'm really annoying. And so I shoot the basketball the first time. And so he's like, Jeremy, will you please stop? To his credit, he said, please stop. But I thought it was kind of funny. So I decided to shoot it again and it hit him again. He said, Jeremy, please, please stop. I'm trying to fix this so we can play on it. I said, oh, okay. And then I shot it again, I shot it again, and I shot it again. The last time I shot, right before it, he said, Jeremy, if you shoot it one more time, I'm throwing this wrench at you. And I thought about it for a second. And I was like, you know, like I'm pretty adorable. Like, why would he throw a wrench at me? And so I shot it again. My brother jumped down 10 feet in the air with a wrench in his hand. And he, I'm, now I'm running. And he's like, hold still so I can throw this at you. And I'm like, yeah, right. I'm not going to hold still. And he throws it at me. Now, it didn't hit me. But... I'm the type of person that I don't retaliate right away. I have a tendency to kind of plan out my like paybacks. And so it was about a day or two goes by and my brother actually climbed a tree. And so I went in my room and I had a BB gun. And so I come out with my BB gun and I pumped it three times right in front of him. And he's like, Jeremy, you better not shoot me with that BB gun. I said, I'm not gonna shoot you because I was thinking just scaring him. But then he gave me the idea. And so what I did is I pointed the gun off in a certain direction. My brother's eyes went to that direction. As soon as I saw that, I pulled the gun over to him and I shot him with a BB gun. He climbed down that tree so fast and there was this feeling of fear, but at the same time, joyous laughing all kind of meshed into one moment. And I just remember like us, we just constantly battled back and forth. It was almost like fighting fire with fire. We always tried to kind of one upmanship each other, like try to try to outdo each other back and forth, back and forth. Today, we're going to be hanging out in First Peter chapter three, and we kind of see this playing out in this kind of manner, uh, how some people may want to relate to each other. And so they kind of fight fire with fire. And so Peter writes what it would look like to actually bless each other as opposed to back and forth, back and forth. And so in chapter three, starting in verse eight, we see this where Peter writes, and he says, finally, all of you having unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart and a humble mind, do not repay evil for evil or reviling. The word reviling essentially means like insulting, okay? So, or in reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessed for this is, uh, for to this, excuse me, you were called that you may obtain a blessing. And verse 10 says, for whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous? Zealous means passionate, okay? So if you are zealous for what is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, 
those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. And lastly, in verse 17, it says, for it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. So there's three things here that I see in, in, in the realm, in the ballpark of this idea of bless or blessing. And so we're gonna kind of lean into those areas of what it looks like to bless people in the midst of hard times. So the first thing is called to be blessed, this, this called to be blessed. And in verse eight, it says, finally, all of you. And, and I wanna kind of pay attention here to this first, finally. When I see this word finally, uh, it, it kind of reminds me of like a pastor who says, in conclusion, or I'm landing the plane. They still had like 10, 20 minutes still left in their message. And Peter still has like a chapter and a half left. And he pulls out this word finally, but then he follows it up with all of you. See, Peter has been talking to a whole bunch of people. He talked to the citizens of the Roman uh, provinces. He's talked to the slaves, the wives, and the husbands. And he's saying, all of you. Now with, now with all of you, you have this calling to bless each other. And then he works through these five characteristics of what this looks like. So the first thing we see, a unity of mind. This unity of mind means it's, it's really kind of the same mindset or the same attitude is what this means when and working together, like in cooperation in the midst of suffering. So having this same mindset, this unity of mind. Now, when terrible things happen, when bad things happen, there's usually, we kind of find ourselves acting in three different ways. There's kind of like three different ways people act. The first is fight fire with fire. When somebody does something, some of us, we stand up, we're ready to fight back. And then there's another group of people that when, when calamity happens or when tragedy happens, they sometimes they run away. They kind of hide away from what, what's taking place. And another type of person, a lot of times what they do is that they kind of, kind of reflect what's going on in the culture around them because they don't want to draw attention to themselves, because they're afraid of what could or would happen to them. And so Peter is saying, have a unity of mind, be at the same attitude of working together in cooperation in the midst of suffering. The next thing we see here is sympathy. Now, sympathy is really referring to having or sharing the same types of feelings for each other. It's to care for each other, even when it's, it, it may be easier to kind of be more okay what's happening to you or what's not happening to you for that matter. And then it's like, you know, I feel bad that it's happening, but, but, but it's okay because I'm hoping that things don't happen. But sympathy is getting onto their level. So, so Peter says sympathy. The next thing he says is brotherly love. And we've talked about this multiple times, what this means. It's a filet type of love. It's a, it's a familial love. It's like family. It, it's serving each other. It's, it's if you have a coat or jacket, you give that to someone who's in need. And so Peter is referencing and say this brotherly family type of love, this characteristic here. The next thing we see is a tender heart. This is all wrapped up in compassion. It's, it's loving. It's getting, it's similar to sympathy, but it's getting on their level. It's compassion for each other. It's not just saying you care, but it's really about showing how you care. And the last characteristic is a humble mind. Now, sometimes when we see humble, we, we instantly think that we have to think of ourselves as nothing. And that's not what Peter's referencing here. What he's saying is putting others' needs in front of your own. It's caring for them first. And it's this humble mindset. Now, for these characteristics to happen, we need to be a different person. Is essentially what Peter's saying is that, and you can't do it on your own. For me and for you, you can't be a uni of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, humble mind, all on your own. It's only through Christ that this can actually happen. Peter is saying, put away your own desires. Put away that instead of matching fire with fire and, and envy with envy and evil with evil, instead of doing all of those things, put away your desires and follow Christ. Be like him. And here's the thing. Before we can be a blessing toward others, there has to be an inward change in us. 
Pastor Jason talks about this and, and I love it. It's, it's so good. It's like, he says, for us to give love, we have to receive love. For us to know how to give grace, we have to receive grace. And in this instance, for, for, for once we receive a blessing, we can give blessings. And it's so good. It's so profound. And Peter is reminding these Christians of, of what it's like to kind of be on the flip side of that. He says in verse nine, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. Remember, reviling is, is like insults, but on the contrary, bless. And one thing I've noticed between verse and verse, verse eight and nine is verse eight is really about an inward unity. And verse nine is like an outward grace. It's like this inward kind of working, the Holy Spirit working through you. And verse nine is about an outward grace. He goes on, but on the contrary, bless for, for to this you were called that you may attain a blessing. I want to draw our attention firstly to this, for to this you were called. You were called, Peter is telling these, these persecuted Christians that they were called to bless. We were called to be and act differently than the world around us and the world around them. We're bless them even when, it's, even when evil is done to bless them even when insults are flying back and forth. Bless them even when it doesn't make sense is what this calling is. And we have this calling because Jesus did this. We, we have this, this, Jesus talks about this, this is calling, excuse me, not Jesus, but, but Paul talks about this calling to imitate Christ. That, that if we are to be Christians, to be Christ followers, we have to, uh, act and work in the way as Christ did. And Peter even talks about this in the chapter we just went over uh, last month in chapter two. In verse 21 through 23, Peter says, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. We have a higher calling than matching evil with evil, than insult with insult. We are called to love even when it's hard, even when it doesn't make sense. But once we do this, something happens to us. We obtain a blessing or, or we receive a blessing. But this is hard. It's hard to live a life when there's persecution uh, that's happening or and especially in this time and place, there is immense persecution to the point of like, these people are putting meat on, on these Christians so dogs would eat them. I mean, like, to a whole different degree of type of persecution. They're being blamed for fires happening. They're being routed out of their homes. They're running. I mean, like all of this stuff is happening to these Christians. And, and they're being, and, and, and Peter's saying that you need to bless them in spite of what's going on. And that's hard. But when we think about at one time, each of us were enemies of God that each of us were in that place where we were, what God wanted, we were opposing that. And what we wanted, God was against. It was just this, this thing, but, but God did something. He resolved the issue between us both by sending his son. And because his son was sent, we, we received grace for us that place our hope and trust in him. We received love for us that place our hope and trust in him, that something changed. And because God did that through Jesus, and if I'm supposed to imitate Jesus and who he is and what he is, I can continue or start to do that in others around me. And for these persecuted Christians, this is what Peter's pushing towards them to become more like Christ and less like their desires that don't honor the Lord. So we love and bless others like Jesus did. And then we will see the blessings of God. In verses 10 through 12, in verses 10 through 12, it's actually quoting uh, King David in Psalm 34. This is what it says, for whoever desires to love life and see good days, just a real quick pause, uh, desires to love life, that is actually talking, the love there is an enjoy. 
So he, he's saying whoever desires to enjoy life and see good days, good here is in reference more towards happy. So whoever desires to enjoy life and, and see happy days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. In verse 12, we see the blessing. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, historically, uh, this, this group of people, like they're used to this Old Testament kind of lifestyle where if, if you are blessed, things like good things are happening for you, whether it's financially or children or whatever. It's like when you are blessed, good things are happening. And when you're not blessed, it's like you have sin in your life and there's some issues that are going on. That's their idea of what blessing is. But Peter kind of says, that's not what this is. As quoting David, he says, this is the blessing. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. That's the blessing. And his ears are open to the prayer. That's the blessing he's talking about. But for this to happen, for this blessing to happen, there's a few things that he's talking to, to the persecuted Christians in the Roman provinces, but even to us, like there's a few things that need to change. And the first is watch our words. We see this in verse 10, it says, and let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Seize your tongue, curb your words. And especially it doesn't make sense when somebody fires at you, you want to fire back. When somebody says something that's hurtful to you, it, it's, it's this natural thing. I want to get back at them and it's back and forth, back and forth. The problem with living that kind of lifestyle is it pulls us further and further and further from what is really needed, which is restoration, which is really needed, which is love. And, and as we fight fire with fire, it pulls us away really what God wants for each of our lives. Another thing that we need to be careful about is watching our actions. Uh, uh, David in uh, Psalm 34 says, turn away from evil and do good, is to watch our actions, to not retaliate, but act out of love and out of care. And the last thing here we see in verse uh, 11 is, is this, this idea to seek peace, to pursue it, to uh, let him seek peace and pursue it. Look for good in those situations. If you want to see uh, 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 good days, if you want to see happy things, if you want to see enjoy your life, there's three things. is Watch your words, watch your actions, and pursue peace. But if you choose not to live this way, we see the flip side of the curse. It says, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. A question I have is, is how can people see Christ's righteousness in us when we follow the steps of the world, when we follow the ways of the world? And, and here plainly it says, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, who, who insult with insult, fire with fire, evil for evil. It's this back and forth, back and forth. A mess of a life. And the third blessing that we see is this blessing while suffering. Now, this one is a hard one to see and a hard one to follow because we have the word suffering, but blessing while suffering. Verse 13, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. I want to stop here just for a second. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Again, Old Testament is this, life is good, you're blessed. Life isn't good, you're not blessed. And there's this contradictory that happens between the two from, from uh, what's actually happening for these persecuted Christians. And Peter is saying, you are blessed when you suffer for righteousness sake. Righteous suffering is this uncompromising commitment to follow Christ despite our broken and sinful world. 
And, and Peter is leaning into this, and it's a heavy thing to lean into that, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. And he goes on and says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, I love this, when you are slandered, Peter's saying, you will be slandered, okay? And he's like, when you are slandered, those who revile, again, insult your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame for it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. In, first, in verse 13, there's an opening question that Peter begins with. He says, now. And, and what he's referring to with now here is the, the blessing. The eyes of the Lord are upon you. That, that blessing we just went over in verse 12. Um, now, he says, now since you know the blessing, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? It's a really rhetorical question. He doesn't answer his own question. And, and for some people, that just drives you nuts when, when they ask you a question, but then they don't have an answer for it. It's just this rhetorical question that Peter asked. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? While we may or could be harmed because we are with God, God promises to always be with us. And this, this uh, Roman Empire where these Christians are being martyred for their faith and persecuted and all of this stuff is happening, Peter is letting them know that while they could be harmed, because God is with them, he promises to never leave them. What a powerful thing. Not only does he bless us with eternal life, once we cross that, once we believe and put our hope and trust and follow Jesus, even after that, he doesn't just give us eternal life, but he promises to always be with us today, in this world, and the world to come. In verse 14, he goes on and says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. We just went over this just real quick, but you will be blessed here is highly privileged. That's the idea behind this blessedness is highly privilegedness. If the world doesn't recognize God in you, does he really reside there? Is he really there? If they don't recognize something different in you, is he really there? And Peter goes on and he says something that's so powerful. He says, have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Peter talks about fear and the right type a fear toward God. It's this awe, it's this respect of who God is. I love this. It's not worried, it's not concerned, excuse me, it's not concerned what, what people may do. Fear is who God is. And that's this right placement of fear. Now remember, these people are under this persecution. And, and from that, it'd be so easy to fight back, to stand up and, and, and do those things, or it'd be so easy to run and hide, or, or it'd be so easy to kind of blend in to the culture around you. And Peter tells them not to have fear. It doesn't make sense. But when we begin to have fear in people, it changes who we are. It changes our actions. It changes what we say. It changes maybe even our values. And we essentially start to become uh, uh, the culture around us when we put fear in people and not in who God is. The right kind of fear of respect and awe. And Peter is pushing them to honor Christ, to be passionate about the gospel and, and to have fearless lives. And then something amazing happens when we do those things. When these people would do those things, something amazing happens. Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you. Because if you live a life that is contrary to what people think you should do, they're going to ask questions. They're going to ask questions like, why do you have joy? Why do you have hope in this scenario, in this life that you're at? 
And for these people, why are you, why are you not biting back or fighting back when, when it seems like that's the thing to do? Why, why aren't you fearful? And because uh, uh, Peter is urging them that, that from your actions of loving first, from your actions of being more like Christ, it will draw people to him. The next thing we see is, and he says, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience. Now, they have every reason to be angry, every reason to be confused. Remember that Old Testament, like, why isn't things better if I'm blessed? They have every reason to be confused and upset. But Peter says, do it with gentleness and respect. Peter is reminding these Christians who their enemy really is. And that's, that's powerful. So my question for you in this, in this space it's important to remember who your real enemy is. So the question is, who's your real enemy? Is it the people in your life? Is it the culture we have? Or is it the enemy? Is it the one who's uh, wanting to kill, steal, and destroy? It's important to have the right perspective of who our real enemy is, and Peter is drawing them to who that is. So for you, tell people where your hope comes from. When you act differently, once you cross that line of faith, once you act differently in the culture and the world around you, tell people where your hope comes from. Peter then says this, he says, for it is better to suffer for doing good. God's way is better than our own. God's way is vastly better than our own. The way God calls us to fight is not the way the world does. God calls us to fight by leading with love. We see this in verse eight. We just went over it. Finally, all of you have unity of mind. This is how you fight your battles. Have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Lead with this instead of your fists. Lead with this instead of your words. Lead with this, then your desires of wanting to attack back. Lead with love. The interesting thing is this doesn't make sense, but miracles rarely do. If you think back to the stories uh, that you heard, maybe when you were a child of David and Goliath, you have this young teenager against this massive man who's nine feet tall. It doesn't make sense. A miracle would happen out of that, that David would win that fight. You think back to a long, even way before that, with the city of Jericho, that they marched around the city, and then eventually the tower or the, the walls fell. It, it's strange. It, it doesn't make sense, but miracles rarely do make sense. You have Gideon, who showed up and had all of these people ready to fight. And God's like, your army's too big. And so it gets dwindled on down all the way down to 300 and Gideon wins this fight, him and his 300. You see, uh, it doesn't make sense, but miracles rarely do. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. And in this time and in this culture, it doesn't make sense that you would imagine that the Roman Empire with all of its strength and power, that they would continue to rule and the Christians would eventually die off. But what actually happens, because the Christians lead with love, they go and they pick up the orphans in the street to love and care for them. They don't fight back in the way that we think they should fight back. They lead with love again and again and again. And what actually happens is that Roman falls and the Christianity continues to rise because Christianity rises in the midst of persecution. You know, for you and for me, let's begin to lead with love and not fight the way the world fights, to trust that God blesses us, that God blesses us in the midst of suffering. So I'm gonna pass off to the campus pastors. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you guys again soon. Hey guys, thanks so much for hanging out with us for a few extra minutes. I want to go over our transformational moment together. Um, we've been going over a certain rhythm for a good portion of the past year or so. 
And uh, I think it matches when I mean, we're talking about blessing and we're talking about blessedness. And so I think it works really well for a transformational moment. We have the bless rhythm. And the blessed rhythm is a way that we can connect with our world around them and potentially lead with love. Yeah, B is begin with prayer. It's an important piece as we pray for those around us to bless them. L is listen, listening to their needs, also listening to what the Holy Spirit may be pushing or, or the Holy Spirit may be kind of urging you to go to. Uh, e is eat. Talking about more of like relationships, like building that relationship. And relationships happen a lot around a table, eating food. Um, S is to serve them, uh, to, to see what their needs are and meet them there. And the last S is to share, to share how Christ has been changing you uh, and who you are today is not who you were. And who you are uh, 10 years from now is not who you want to be today. It's continued change or sharing about the change that is happening within you. So let me pray for you as um, we kind of close up today. God, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you that you bless us. You don't just bless us with uh, eternal life uh, that is found in you, which is amazing. But you also give us blessings to the world that we live in now. In the midst of suffering, in the midst of frustration, in the midst of bad things that happen in our world, as well as what was happening here, you were with them. God, I pray that you continue are with us, that we not just, and I know that that happens, but that we sense that you're with us every step of the way. So God, change us from the inside out so we can be a blessing to the world around us. We trust these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Have a great week and we'll see you guys soon. Bye guys.